so uh, welcome. Um, I'm happy to introduce Roberto Di Cosmo. Uh, Roberto and I go back a long time. Uh, in fact, we were in college together uh, in Pisa and uh, the University of Pisa and the Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa. Roberto got his degree in 86 and his PhD in 92. And I can say with absolute certainty that we were never involved in any prank together in those days. Uh, so after leaving Pisa, uh, he, <laughs> he, <laughs> he, moved to, he moved around a little bit and then he settled in Paris, first at, uh, at l'Ecole Normale Supérieure and then uh, ultimately moved to INRIA, which is uh, a national research institute for computer science and automation and is the director there. Okay, now? Yeah. Better? Okay, fantastic. Okay, so first of all, thanks a lot for, uh, for uh, inviting me to be here. It's a real pleasure to, to, well, to see Massim again and see you for the first time. Uh, I would like to tell you a little bit more about what we are doing to build a, a universal archive of software today and why we believe this is really an interesting infrastructure for open science in general. Uh, but first of all, a few more information about myself. I'm actually a full professor in computer science in Paris. I'm now working at Kenya specifically on this project whose code name is Software Heritage. And to, to sum up what I have been doing in my career, basically I have spent 30 years doing computer science, from theoretical computer science, I mean semantics, logics, rewriting, proving programs correct, these kind of things, parallel programming, functional programming, and then later on software engineering. Uh, that's the reason, I mean, the theoretical computer science part is the reason why my Erdos number is three, for, for the curious one. Then I spent 20 years working on free software and open source software in general, so as an advocate, as a developer, as a member of the community, and then uh, when you grow a little bit older, you assume more responsibilities. So over the past 10 years, I have spent time building structures for the common good. So typically, for example, the free software thematic group in a, in a big cluster in Paris actually helped uh, fund almost 40 projects fully based on open source technologies. And then uh, the last uh, st uh, step in the story is running software heritage today. So now let's move on to what this, all, uh, this is all about. So we all know that software is all around us. So it is basically the full of innovation, the engine of our industry. It's a pillar of modern scientific research in all fields. So I have friends, for example, that do uh, uh, natural language processing. And of course, they use computers. I, I have friends in, that are historians. They, they use statistical software. So you use software everywhere. It's not just in the hard science like ours. And we ended up actually considering that the source code of this software is actually today a very special form of human knowledge, which is a growing part of our own cultural heritage. But so what, what do I mean here? I mean, source code is a special form of knowledge. It's a growing part of our cultural heritage. Well. You know, when I was a student back in, in Pisa in 1985, I was using a book by Harold Haberson, uh, who is a professor at MIT in computer science. In the introduction of the book, you had this phrase here. So programs must be written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute. So, well, of course, I mean, this is an MIT professor, so you can think he's just telling the students, if you turn in a homework and I cannot read it, what you mean, then you get an F instead of an A, so, well, sure. But it is more deep than that. Actually, programs evolve over time, so you need to read it to understand what happens and change them over time. It is not the other engineer that we need to understand. Maybe the other engineer or the other scientist is you in two weeks. So it's better to write in such a way that you can understand what is going on. When, when Arrol was writing this in 1985, it is not so clear because uh, what he meant, because there was not that much uh, source code really available. Most of the source code was behind closed doors in companies. But today, I mean, 30 years later, uh, 
we have an incredible amount of source code available. And if you look into this uh, uh, great uh, amount of software available, you can find some jewels. Like, for example, I have handpicked a couple of them. Uh, let's spend a few minutes just on this. So who has ever played with, do you remember Doom, anybody? Yes. Uh, Quake, yes. Uh, do, if you have kids, probably Call of Duty, maybe. Yeah, so you know what it is. I mean, it, it makes your kids spend an incredible amount of time, at least mine, I mean, playing this kind of stuff. But it's a first person shooting game, uh, which was, I mean, Doom at the origin used a kind of thing which was not really 3D, it was 2D and a half because of I mean, limitation in the hardware. And the, this Quake 3 was, you know, Quake 3 Arena was a wonderful game and it was developed by ID Software where a, an incredible developer, John Carmack, was working. He wrote most of the source code. And if you look in the source code, you find this part here, which is actually a super smart way of computing one over square root of x without calling the floating point coprocessor because at the moment, this floating point coprocessor was too slow to actually perform this in such a way that you could play the game. So instead of just saying, well, okay, square root of x and then one over square root of x, two operations, slow, you do something else. So this is, but you take your floating point number here, then, I mean, there are some additional constants here, but basically you read it as a long integer, so you, you just look at the sequence of bits in the floating point, you do not interpret it as a floating point manner in a way, and you see the comment, so edit floating point bit level hacking, so this is an operation that actually costs nothing at execution time because it is just a typecast, okay? And then you see here, you read back as a floating point something that was considered as a, just a bit vector, which again costs nothing because it is just a typecast. And then in the middle, you do some evil, you see the comment that I will not read here, I mean, this, this, what is going on? So you basically, you take this bit vector, you shift it by one, so you divide it by two, and then you subtract it to a crazy constant that comes out of nowhere. Actually, if you're curious to really understand what is going on here, just put this constant here in Wikipedia. There is a specialized page just analyzing the history of this particular piece of code. But just to, for the curious, let me sum up very briefly. If you take the IEEE 32-bit representation of floating point numbers, you basically have eight bits for the exponent, 24 bits for the mantis. And so here you are computing square root of x. And so if you want to compute square root of x in a kind of very smart way, one way is to say, hey, square root of x, let's take the logarithm. So logarithm of x and square logarithm of the square root of x is just one over two of the logarithm of x. Okay, so you see one over two is just this division. And why should the mantissa be logarithm of x? Because it is one plus, logarithm of one plus x with x relatively small is almost x. So you just play this particular game here, and then this crazy constant is just there to get rid of the exponent and get rid of some extra data that come in in the computation. And once you get this, that's of course just a, a rough approximation of one over square root of x. It is not already square root of x. And so then you start doing this crazy thing here, but luckily you have an iteration, first iteration, second iteration comment here that is basically telling you, well, you are taking this as a first approximation in a Newton method to go to the real result. And you see, one iteration is enough to play the game, no point of doing two iterations, so you don't see the difference. And that's it, okay. I mean, this is a kind of a jewel. I mean, to, to read and understand what is going on, you need a little bit of time. But luckily, you have comments, you have the name of the variables. I mean, this is three half after all, okay? So you can read it and you can understand. But if you only had the binaries, good luck trying to understand what this code is actually doing. I mean, you really need the source code to understand. And here I have another example from the, the, the network queuing uh, implementation. In, in Linux, but I will not go into that. You have many, many examples which are interesting in there. So you see, 
That's the reason why Len Schusten, who is the board director of the Computer History Museum in Mountain View here, actually wrote in a beautiful paper in 2006 that the source code of a program actually provides a view in the mind of the designer. Okay? So this is actually precious code, precious information. Most of the people in our society do not understand this because they have never seen a line of code. Okay? The same reason, I mean, if, if you don't study mathematics, you don't understand the, the beauty of mathematics. If you don't see source code, you don't understand this, the beauty and the importance of the knowledge in source code. Okay? And actually, the point is that source code is more recent than most of other, other disciplines. It just started more or less 50 years ago. So, uh -huh. I'm very happy to more show you this example here, since you are part of this NASA, NASA fantastic uh, undertaking. So, in 1969, this lady, Margaret Hamilton, who, by the way, is 82 years old, still alive, and an incredibly bright person, he actually uh, uh, supervised a team of 400 people who actually vote the 60,000 lines of code which were in the Apollo guidance computer which was used to put a man in the moon for the first time. And at that moment, I mean, you see, 60,000 lines of code, just to remember, when you print them out, it's a lot. Huh? We don't print them out uh, any longer, but it's a lot. It's, I mean, it's important to, to get an idea of how much it is. And she wrote in that moment, actually, at that moment there were no book books to, to tell you how to build a real-time resilient system. Uh, so it was really the Wild West. I mean, 50 years later, in your pockets, you have things that we actually try to call phones, but are not phones. I'm actually much more powerful than the computers 10 years ago. And just one of the thin layers on the, sitting on the bare metal of these phones is the Linux kernel, because in the Android phone, which is 90%, 80% of the market today, uh, you have a Linux kernel hidden behind. And the Linux kernel is more or less 20 million lines of code today. So imagine if you bring them out. I mean, see in our pockets. So you see the exponential growth here from in 50 years, the size of the software you're building. So the big question is, are we taking care of this software today? Well, you would expect the answer to be yes. After all, there is no uh, richer uh, sector of industry than IT. You have incredibly huge companies. I mean, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, I mean, App Apple. They have billions of cash just in, in the bank account. They don't know what to do with that money. I mean, it's just there. So you would expect that these people whose business is actually relying on software did something to take care of this precious part of our heritage. You would expect. But unfortunately, the answer is no. So, sure. What is that step? Haha, a Houston. Ah, okay. So the question here is: this this diagram I'm showing here is evolution of the con of the number of lines of code which are in present in the Linux kernel, and uh, uh, the question is: you can see some spikes there. In particular, there is one very important spike from T6 to uh, to five to T6, basically going up there. And the question is: what what happens in there? The honest answer now, right now, I cannot tell you because I, I, I do not know. But I remember, if I am not wrong, 2.5, I think should be maybe 98, and I should check. I mean, there, there is a particular moment, there is a particular moment in the growth of the Linux kernel where the, the, actually the owner of the code, Linux Torvalds, stopped trying to do everything by himself and actually set up a network of uh, Lieutenant, I don't know, of, of, um, I mean, is this an English word? No. Uh, uh, Lieut lieutenant, I mean, uh, se yeah. second in command, yeah. lieutenant. Yeah. People, people so working, people. yes. Because actually he insisted in reviewing each and every single patch that was submitted to the Linux kernel, and of course this does not scale up at all. Okay, so after a moment, there, you had a lot of people upset because their patches are waiting for months and they're not at, uh, 
not included. So some people in the, the open source community put, went together, discussed it with Linux, and, and they finally convinced him to, to, to let go a little bit and to have people around that could take decisions. And after that, a lot of code that was waiting was inserted. Social, social, social socialization, extremely important. It also looks like they were heading towards the release of the third release of the code. Have you the releases after that? Ah, sure, two, six, two, three. Yeah. But again, don't take this for the final answer. This is just out of my memory, so one should check for the version. But this actually happened. But so, as I was telling you, uh, unfortunately, we are not really taking care of this. Uh, haters. Maybe, you know, because computer science is very young, so we, even us as computer scientists, tend to think, of, I tend to think of myself as a young person, I don't know why, and it's a kind of point of view. So you don't think about death or the, the, the something that you can lose something. So you look to the future and never to the past. And actually, what happens today is that we don't take care of this sort of heritage uh, software part of our heritage in several, for several reasons. You know, remember, I, I told you, software is everywhere. That's true, but it's also everywhere in a bad sense. It's spread all around. So if you look for a particular software project today, where is it? Well, when I started putting my code somewhere, some 15 years ago, it was in a place that was called uh, SourceForge, that nobody even remember today. There are some hundred thousand projects in there. This company has been bought and sold and in for a moment they actually was distributing malware because I mean when you went to download a piece of software they added some extra software from people that paid for, for uh, the company to add extra software you download it together with which is crazy thing. So people moved away. Today the most popular at all is GitHub which everybody is excited about. But you know, if you remember, I mean, this summer GitHub has been bought up by Microsoft for seven billion dollars, by the way, which is, uh, I mean, this is kind of recorded, but for me, it's a very good news because, I mean, that company is important for our way of doing software today. So it's important to get the cash to make the system work. But for a lot of people in my community, which is open source, I mean, having Microsoft buying GitHub is a reason to just move away. And you have tens of thousands of projects that went away from GitHub to GitLab. In, uh, you have some statistics if you look at all this. But I mean, you also had Google Code, beautiful platform, 1,500,000 projects. They use it in particular functionality for code review, which was a, a tool called a Garrett, originally developed for Android, but very useful to force people to review the code of others before accepting into the main line. Then you had Gitorios, etc. And then I do not know you, but for me, I have had a lot of PhD students. So every time you get the new PhD students, he can, or she comes in and tells you, ha you are still on SourceForge. Ah. SourceForge has been, now you need to move to Gitorios. So, okay, you move from Subversion to Git and move to Gitorios. So then somebody else comes in, no, no, Gitorios, I mean, uh, has been, you should move to Guitar. So you move to Guitar. And then last summer, somebody comes in, ah, Guitar has been bought up by the forces of evil. So you should move to GitLab. Come on. I mean, so you have your project going around from one place to the other. You lose track of what is going. So that's a big mess. And so basically, to sum it up in one line, we do not have a universal catalog of all the source code out there. We don't have a single place where I can go and say, hey, this particular project, where is it? Where did it come from? Where is it going? We don't have it. Worse, either, even worse, software is fragile. Like all uh, digital information, you can lose it, you can erase it, uh, you can be hacked. Your server can go on fire. So all this is one of the reasons why we all do backups, right? But doing backups is just half of the story. Then you should try to recover the backup and see what happens. I mean, last year in February, uh, GitLab here had a little glitch because one of the engineers did some stupid thing in the, in the operation room and they lost basically six hours of development of everybody that was using GitLab. 
Uh, hey, they had five levels of backups. I mean, it's a serious operation. So they tried to recover, and the five levels of backups, or recovery of backups, failed one after the other. So they actually lost six hours of the history. Okay? So you can Google this up, you will see it's a funny story. But the most worrying thing is actually what has happened to Google Code and to Gitorius. So I had some code here on Gitorius, not on Google Code. In March 2015, I got a mail from the CEO of Gitorius, which was, I have to say, I, I, I was very admirative of the communication skill of this guy. I mean, the mail was great news. Great news? GitHub is, sorry, GitLab? No, wait. Gitorius, I mean, too many. Gitorius has been acquired by GitLab. Great news. Sure, for him. But then you read the mail, and at the end he says, so you know, I understand now we have two, pla having two platforms, it's not really very practical. So in three weeks, we are going to shut down Gitorius, and of course we are not going to move the data from Gitorius to GitLab. That's up to you, okay? So take your stuff and go away. And so 120,000 projects on Gitorius. And you know, three weeks is kind of short, in particular for open source software. Maybe you decided to go to Tibet to see a Zen master and spend a couple of months there. Then you come back and your stuff has gone. I mean, really. The same month, Google Code announced they were going to shut down their platform. That was 1,500,000 projects. Well, of course, Google is more classed. So you had one year to go around. So you have the time to go to Tibet and come back and fix your stuff. So they provided, but this is really new. So it's the first time we see that a business decision, because it is just a business decision, it is not they had lack of money or whatever, just decided they were no longer interested in maintaining all this stuff, can endanger millions of projects. This is really, really new. So it is at this particular moment that you take, uh, you become aware that we do not have an archive. So we don't have a catalog, but we don't even have an archive. An archive is not a development platform. You see, this platform here, this is a development platform. This is a distribution platform. These are distribution platforms. I, I'm sure you know this, CRAN, I mean, the Comprehensive R Archive Network, I mean, for statistics. No one, none of these is an archive. We don't have an archive. And then last thing, we don't have a universal infrastructure for doing research on source code. So source code or software today has been, is pervasive, is present everywhere. It is in our bodies for people that have a pacemaker. Software controls the pacemaker. Okay? If you are doing transport, I don't know, 30% of non, I mean, of, of uh, car issues that force you to call somebody to bring the car back into the garage are due to software glitches, okay, not to mechanical ones. And th this is something you can say I told you, but I, I will never say I said yes. I mean, this is privileged information from the car industry I got from a friend. But so basically, aha, uh -huh. it's a fantastic situation. You just pay for somebody to click on the reset button of the car. I mean, it's an extremely interesting business operation. But anyway, so, so it's really important. So you would expect mankind to be able to fund an international infrastructure for improving the quality of our software, looking at the galaxy, all the software projects, and try to spot all the errors, improve them, putting all the research community working together. And I'm telling this to you because I'm extremely jealous of what you in physics are able to do, because you are able to convince people to build these beautiful things that I like a lot, to look at the star, understand the origin of our life. And we, as computer scientists, with billions of dollars in cash in these big companies are not able to convince people to build such an infrastructure. Okay, so this is a kind of a very unsatisfactory situation. But I believe it comes from the fact that computer science is kind of young. But then I would like to spend a few more minutes to, to tell you a little bit more about what happens in our field, I mean, mine and yours in research. Okay? Because not only we don't have a catalog, we don't have an archive, we do not have a uh, 
global research infrastructure for improving the quality of software. But then, if you look at the way we write scientific articles that use a software all the time, okay, in the moment where you, we know there is a scientific crisis because we are not able to reproduce easily the, re, the research results we are publishing, the situation is, gets even worse. So, for example, for research software, look, here I'm, I'm doing my own mea culpa. I'm a computer scientist, so I'm showing to you only analysis of research work in computer science. So ICSI is an international conference of software engineering. This is a major, the main, the top conference in software engineering in the world. So already in 2006, these people tried to look into the papers published in that conference and they discovered there was no replication study. So you get some study from somebody saying, oh, if you develop software this way, you get this particular result, and nobody ever checked it, which is bad. Then here, Carlo Getzi, which is one of the big people in software engineering, for example, in, in, a, uh, in a keynote he uh, gave in 2009, he analyzed this transaction of software engineering, which is a top journal in, in software engineering. And so, looking at these years, he found that 60% of the papers published there mentioned tools or described tools which are used for analyzing software, and then tried to see how many of them could be installed and only 20% of this 60% could be actually installed, which is worrying. I mean, if computer science can get it right, we are the supposedly the expert here. And then, more, much more recently, in 2015, a colleague here, which is Christian Kolberg, published a reproducibility study looking at 600 papers from the top conference in journals in computer science. And found 50, 500 with tools inside and only 40% of the tools installable, which does not mean that the research is reproducible. So the only thing you do is try to get the source code, compile it and run. It doesn't mean it provides the same result, just this. So this is a disaster for research. So I remember being, coming from Pisa, I mean, Galileo Galilei, the, the scientific method is to make an observation, set up an experiment, prepare a theory, and val validate the theory of the experiment, and then uh, repeat again, uh, reprodu verif reproduce and, ver and verify. And, and you know what are the main reasons why, for these kind of failures here? Is that the source code of the, paper, uh, art uh, of the art software artifacts mentioned in this paper cannot be found either the source code or the right version of the source code. So some people say, ah, the result in that data, hmm, the source code, maybe this one, I don't know, I can give you this source code, but I'm not sure it is the one which was used for doing this particular experiment. I mean, this, this is terrible. And so, what does it mean it cannot be found? So, for example, I kind of old, so I, since day one, since I'm a very open access and open source person, I always tried in my papers to make available the data and the software which are used to manipulate this data. But the uh, first thing that I did many years ago, it was just a pointer to my web page. Very bad idea, because URLs, uh, URL to your web page, URLs decay. And it, actually, it is written in the specs. If you look at the specification by Tim Berners-Lee himself, he already wrote, I mean, there is no general guarantee that URL points to something and will keep pointing to that. It's very trivial, but it is even written down. Okay. And a colleague of mine actually did an experiment a few years ago looking at the top journals in computer science, I think, computer and communication of the ECM in this period, and he computed the half-life of the URS, which is basically four years. So after four years, half of the URS in these top journals point to nowhere. And actually, this is a study which has been replicated quite a lot of time in different places. So URS are bad ideas. Actually, you should know, I handpicked this example just for you, so knowing I was coming here. Here is an interesting paper published in 2014 in August that actually looked at a lot of uh, articles published in astronomy, looked for pointers to data 
which are shared in these papers, these data are mentioned through URLs. And these URLs, well, <clears throat> you see, so 110 broken links over 800 links. And this is actually at Harvard. It is not a lost uh, university in the middle of nowhere, OK? So, yes, so uh, uh, my slides will be online, so you can pinpoint, check if your data <laughs> is, in, is in here. So that's not a good idea. But then people propose to use something else. I mean, DOIs. Uh, who knows what a DOI is? No, you should all know. I mean, the digital object identifiers are the, the thing that publisher put on top of your paper to be able to do something. And so how, the, how do these DOI work? So to point to a particular paper, you say you have this mambo jumbo here that says DOI 10.1109 slash something. And to understand what this means, the only solution is to go to a place which is called the resolver, where there is a database that tells you to this particular mambo jumbo corresponds a URL. Okay. So you get a URL, and not you because you're in a rich place, but in somebody else, we usually see a pop-up page that says, ask for your credit card number to access the object behind it. But if you already subscribe, we find this which is a page describing the object, not the object itself. The, the object itself is in a, in a PDF. Here you see download PDF. You click there, another URL to download the, this object. So basically, you are replacing a URL with a hidden database, with a mambo jumbo, and two URLs. So the basic architecture is when you have a UI, you send it to a, to a resolver that gives the correspondence to URL. We give it back to the browser that goes to a publisher gateway that pops up the credit card pressure or whatever. Then you get the object information, then you get the object back. So basically, what, what I mean, I mean, for computer science, this is crazy. I mean, the UI resolution can change, the content given the URL can change, and there is no way of noticing it. So you have a UI pointed to something in two weeks or in two seconds, can point to something else, you have no way of, of saying this. And of course, the persistence of all these systems is based on goodwill of multiple parties. It is a social issue, not a technical issue. It can work. It does work in in the publishing industry. But you have no technical guarantees that these identifiers actually continue to point to the right thing. So you see, OK, too much time spending on what doesn't work. Okay, so, But the point is that today we are really at a turning point for several reasons. We do not have a catalog. We don't have an archive. We have no stable references. And if you look at the past, I mean, the history of computer science is just half a century. So most of the people who actually developed everything we are using are still there. We can go ask them to help them find the important parts of the software that has changed the other world. Our world. We can do it. But here, the, the clock is ticking. I mean, the biological clock is ticking, because people will not stick around forever. And if you look at the future, there has never been so much software developer and developer as today. You have more programmers and more code coming in, and I have even some numbers to tell you. So we have been observing the, the, the evolution of the original content in the archive we are building. And basically, we have a doubling of original content every 30 months. We have been observing this stably, in a stable way over the last 10 years. So it's really essential today provide, to provide an infrastructure that provides a catalog, an archive, and stable references for the future. So that's what we are trying to do. And this is the whole scope of the Software Heritage Initiative. We are building any, an, an initiative whose mission is precisely to go out there and collect every piece of source code available, make sure it is not lost, preserve it, and make sure it can be reused. I mean, reused, not compiled, but I mean, accessed and found for the people. And we want to do this for all the source code, all the software that are written. It is not just about preserving the past. It is also about enhancing the way they develop software today and preparing for better software tomorrow. How would you? go about building something with this kind of ambition. So of course, you can make a scientific project. You can create a startup. There are many possibilities. I mean, startups, I don't believe it. I mean, look at what Google did. They had 
piles of cash and they shut down Google Code because of moments somebody decided it was no longer interesting. So I don't believe in a company with stakeholders, with stockholders, sorry, at that particular moment. Scientific projects usually have a limited duration, so we wanted to go to another idea. The idea is an international foundation that takes all this, care of this. And so we have written down in a paper, which you can find here, which is fully open access, the full principle of how we build this infrastructure. But the core ideas can be summed up in this slide here. Basically, an infrastructure. So we are really only collecting, preserving, and making available the source code. We are not building all the applications that you can imagine on top of such an infrastructure. And there are a bunch of applications for industry, for research, for education, for cultural heritage. We just want to, talk, to work with everybody interested in doing these applications, make sure they find in our infrastructure what is needed for their development. But you, we do not want to overstep on their job. We have enough in our hands for doing this. Then, just to give you some numbers, I mean, this is not sli just slide where we have been working for almost four years on this project. So today, we have over 80 million projects indexed, which boils down to almost 5 billion unique source files and over 1 billion unique commits. Unique is important here because actually we do massive deduplication in the archive to make it manageable. And some of the principles we have, of course, I mean, from the technology point of view, we every, every technological decision is trans transparent. You can see our mailing list are open, IRC channel are open, and you have uh, everything we build is free and open source software because if we are here to preserve software for the long time and I use a proprietary solution, you should not trust me okay, because I don't know how it works. The other point is that for the contents, we use intrinsic identifiers. We have billions of objects around, okay? I cannot count on manual curation to make sure that the pointers to this object will be the same over time. I need to have a technological solution to this. And these are these identifiers. And then facts and provenance, and the organization is non-profit and based on a mirror network. So probably, instead of... Uh, 14 minutes. Let, let, let me try. So how we do this? Actually, we go out there and we collect proactively code from a lot of different places. So we index GitHub, we index GitLab, we index Debian, which is a distribution. We are indexing PyPy, for example, for the packages. There are package management system, distributions, development platform, all of these things. So it's a challenge like the one of the Internet Archive, the only difference is that the Internet Archive has HTTP, which is a standard to connect it for connecting to websites. We do not have any standard because the even feed on GitHub and the even feed on GitLab and the even feed on, on Debian are not at all the same, so we need to build adapter. But and once we do all this, which is we, an operation we call listing, we get a lot of pointers to version control system or packages so that can be Git, Subversion, Bazaar, Mercurial, Darks, whatever, CVS, RCCS for the whole project. And it is not enough to just store a copy of this version control system in the original form, because in 10 years, who tells you you will be able to read it? So we decided to go the extra mile and actually build the second level of conversion, so we actually convert everything in this version control system, be it Git, Mercurial, packages, or whatever, into a unique, uniform representation, which is a gigantic graph. Technically, it is a Merkel direct acyclic graph, which is the same technology you find used in Git, in Bitcoin, in distributed file system like IPFS, etc. It all started in the Plan 9 project some 20 years ago. And and so here you have contents and directories and commits and releases fully deduplicated. So the full development history is now completely archived in a uniform way. So in 20 years you come back, you have the simple structure of this graph, you can still work it even without the tools originally used to develop the version control system. We are automatically indexing GitHub. We are lagging a little bit behind because we are not Google, but I mean, we are doing it for GitHub. We are automatically indexing Debian. This summer, we added GitLab. We have recovered, these are the good news. We have the full history of Gitorius and Google Code. 
because our project was already there when they shut down. So we went and talked to the people to get the data out before it was uh, closed down. All the history of GNU. And then the good news is that all this, don't laugh at me, it, it is only 200 terabytes of raw data. And why only 200 terabytes? Because there is a lot of sharing here. So if you make 1,000 copies of the full Linux source code, which are hundreds of millions of lines of code, uh, tens of millions of lines of code, well, we just keep one copy and 1,000 links saying, ah, you made a copy here, a copy there, a copy there. But you don't duplicate it. And the graph that we are building here, for, for people use it to use Git, this is a kind of a Git graph up at the scale of the planet, so it across all projects. It is almost, is a few terabytes, 10 billion nodes, 100 billion edges already. I said one of the biggest public graphs you can get. And the history of development of our software. So I cannot go through all this, otherwise it takes some time, but I give you in the, no, well, this is a preview, on, this is not me, I mean, this is a previewer in the market. So you take, uh, use it, another PDF previewer, you, it will work better. Uh, what I would like to you, tell, to show you how to actually use this, because this is a lot of talking abstractly, I think you prefer to put your hands on this stuff. So first of all, you remember I told you we were working in three phases, collect, preserve, and share. So my priority was collecting before the things go away, preserving before, I mean, to make sure it is stable, and sharing would come later. Actually, just we just opened up the public access to the archive on June 7th at UNESCO in, in, a, in a public ceremony. So if you go here, for example, www.softwareheritage.org, what you see is a front shop of our project. So you have a very nice uh, website that explains what we are doing, etc. But I think what you're interested in is to click on archive on the top there. And if you click, if I can click on archive, here it starts becoming interesting. Like for example, you can go and try to search inside, ah, let me, you see the numbers? because my slides are not up to date, so 84 million project, almost 5 billion source files, almost 10 million releases, over 1 billion commits, etc. Then you can go and search it. For example, you can go here and say, let's see, Apollo 11, okay, as I showed to you. <clears throat> and here you get a full copy archived of the Apollo 11 call, which was uploaded on GitHub a, a few years ago. But the difference is that this is an archive, it is not a development platform. And there are some parts of this code that I, I just love. I mean, I don't know if you ever look at this one. This is a master initial routine uh, for, for the LEM programs and LEM modules. And I mean, Again, that was basically assembler for this machine uh, in the particular moment. So you have a lot of comments to explain what is going on. And there is, there are parts of these comments which are absolutely beautiful. Like here, for example, <laughs> you see, I mean, here, these people, I mean, Adler and Ice, I do not know them, I mean, the people who actually wrote the program are explaining that these different programs for the LEM, which are P10, P11, P14, are different are implemented as a single piece of code, I mean, a single routine, and then the variation are in tables. So you call the routine with a pointer to the table that correspond to the particular program. And so they explain it works this way. And then they put this kind of comments here, you see. The master initial routine was conceived and executed and not a bene, it's maintained by other and days. This means we did it, we know how it works, don't touch it, so first of all, this is ancient French, which basically means shame on you if you think badly on what we are doing. And then here are the tables for the initial routine, and then it says, noli se tangere in Latin, which is don't touch unless you know what you are doing. I mean, this is really sensitive code. 
So there are beautiful things like this ones, which are only in the comments. And then imagine now you want to point to this particular part because you find it is really interesting. So you can click here, shift click there. So now you have a selection of the code. And you see this particular red tab here, which are called permalinks. So after I told you why I don't believe DOIs are something that we can use in our archive because we have billions of objects and we need to maintain integrity over time, now I need to tell you what we use. And what we use are these kind of persistent intrinsic identifiers. So what you see here is SWH, I mean, this identifier schema for software heritage, one version one of the schema, CNT content, this identifier for a content object, and then this thing here that also looks like Pambo Jumbo, but actually is the SHA-1 checksum of the file we are pointing to. And this SHA-1 checksum is intrinsic because you compute it on the file. You don't need somebody else to tell you what is the correspondence? You just run a program that gives you the checksum. And then, if you need to find again this particular piece of software later on, even if software ratio doesn't exist, you can go to some places, compute checksum on a lot of pieces of code until you find the one that is the one you are pointing to. And of course, you have these stable identifiers, but you can add some decorators. Like, for example, you can add information about the line numbers and also add information about the origin. I mean, this information are not intrinsic because the line number is something you add and the origin is a place where you find it, but maybe you can find it in 20 other places, but you can add it. And once you have this, you can copy this permalink or copy identifier. You can tweet it. You can send it to somebody else. You can put it in a paper, you know, to reference a piece of code. And then if you click on that particular link, you get back exactly to the same page, exactly in the same position, which is something I actually was dreaming of doing some, 20, some 10 years ago when I started publishing papers with code in them. Like, for example, look at this. <clears throat> what is the result tower? I don't, okay, let me click this. Okay, I, I told you I made all possible mistakes, so I'm, I'm showing you one of my mistakes a uh, long time ago. This is a paper which was published in 12, 2012 with a friend of mine in Pisa, by the way, working on parallel programming. So it was a very nifty trick using the, 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 the virtual memory property uh, of, the, of the Unix operating system to uh, implement a map and reduce, uh, very simple way of doing map and reduce on a, on a multi-core system. So you have a standard a computer science paper with a design, what we are doing. Then you have example of the code. Let me go to the example of the code. Uh -huh. Where is it? See, this is actually an excerpt of the real code which is in the paper, but it's just paper. I would like to go to the code. I didn't know how to do this. So we just copied it in. And then at the end of the paper, You see, we were saying already the full source code of the Parmap library is available under the LGPL license from gitorius.org slash Parmap. Uh -huh. So you click on gitorius.org. And now, 404, huh? bad news. But now we can go back here and then you can say, Let's try gitorios.org slash permap. Uh, Victorious. Ah, nice lapsus. Gitorios. Okay, and so here it is. Okay. So that's a copy. So just when we got it, I had already moved it to GitHub. But now, if you want, you can look at the full history of the archive. And so this was the version just before moving to GitHub. So this is exactly the version which was mentioned in the paper. You see? And for example, if I wanted to actually show you the piece of the code which is in the paper, 
I could have gone here and see it is just this part here. Okay. And so I could have just put in the paper this identifier. You see? And then you have a paper where you click, and you go to the archive, you find exactly the part of the code you're interested in, in exactly the version of the system you're talking about. And this is working today. By the way, if you want to, uh, there are so many other features I, I, I do not have time to go through now. But for example, you have seen we are indexing data in an active way. We go and pull data out. But there are many things we don't know about which are interesting. So we just this is not published yet. It is already working. We didn't announce it, but you, you see it for the first time. It is possible to go on this page and click on a save code now functionality. So you can point us to a particular Git repository and tell, please go and get it. And see, this basically creates a set of requests to, to get things. For example, we didn't have GNOME that has its own forge. So somebody submitted it. And we accept it. There is a human in the loop here eh, looking at what you are submitting, so we do not archive any you know, porno movies or whatever. And so, and then the, this is a succeeding, and we go and succeed, for example, for GNOME. Here you have the full archive of this particular part of the GNOME project. So we are slowly building new functionalities on top of it. So. <coughs> I'm, I'm ah. No. Common F? No. Option F? No. View? Full screen. <laughs> okay. So, sorry. And, and, and as you know, I'm extremely passionate about what we are doing now, so I spend too much time telling you why we are passionate doing this and not, not enough about what is going on, but in the, in the slides you have pointers to the different functionality which are available, and I would like to use a few seconds I have left. Uh, what is this doing? Autoplay. How can Please I set to full autoplay? screen mode instead of slideshow. Try full screen mode. Uh, this is what I tried to do. View. Ah, full screen, okay. Yeah, there Thanks. You know. So uh, now you get a better idea of what we are doing, but why is this relevant for open science? Y you have seen the example in the paper, it's kind of interesting. But we believe that if you want to do open science, you need open access article, and this has been a long fight for 20 years. That open data set, you need this, because otherwise you cannot reproduce the results. But you also need the source code of the research uh, tools we are using to reproduce the result. And up to now, we have a lot of solutions for this and that, and not, so, not many solutions for this, because we don't have archives. We are often abusing development platform as archives, but as you have seen with Gitorios or, or uh, Google Code, they are not archives. They can go away. So we need an archive. And we believe we are providing this with software heritage today. And actually, at the end of this month, let me go quickly, at the end of this month, we are going to open the, the National Open Access Archive in France, which is called HAL, where everybody is depositing their open access paper. We are opening a functionality to deposit software in the same portal. Up to now, it is limited to the zip or targz files, not much more than that, because I mean, for, for Git repository, it is much better to go to the same code now. But for this kind of Deposit is very important because we have a lot of colleagues that publish their software as zip files on their web pages. And this is extremely fragile. You need to go and get this before it goes away. Uh, and why I believe this is the way to go to archive and reference scientific software, because first of all, you get intrinsic ideas, the way you, you have seen there which does not depend on resolver and it guarantees integrity. So you can download something which is pointer for a paper and then you recompute the hashes and you can check the source code you got is exactly the one that was mentioned in the paper and not something else, something that you cannot do with the other technologies. Uh, and then since we are building software related, not just for science, but for a lot, a lot of other applications, there are new features that will come in for free. For example, browse, download, provenance information, 
we are working on a provenance index that allows you to, to say, I, I had this particular file here. Where has it been seen first in the world? Since we have the graph, the full graph, this is possible. Not easy, but it's possible. So the challenge is how to do it efficiently. But you, you see the, the potential of something like this? I can say, I have this file, the first appearance is September 3rd, 2003, in this particular project. How did it evolve? How did it evolve over time? And then the other point is that we actually do not archive just scientific software. We archive all software. And when you write scientific software, very often you point to a library which are outside that you just reuse. How do you mention them? Okay, so if you use uh, this kind of infrastructure, all software is in there. So you can reference any software. And up to now, other, I mean, this is a key school effect we decided to have at the beginning. We are using up to now identifiers which are Git compatible. So if you are using Git as a version control system, you take the hash of a commit. This hash of the commit works right away in software heritage to find exactly the same uh, commit archive. And just to finish, so we are building this for the long term, so it's not an easy undertaking, I can tell you. I spent all my time for four years just on this. We need political support. This is the reason why on, on April 3rd in 2017, uh, last year, we had a huge event at UNESCO where you had the former president of the French Republic, the former director of the area, and the former director general of UNESCO signing an agreement on long-term preservation and access for source code. So this is one of the first time I have seen in high-level political uh, people, in the speeches of these high-level political people, programming source code mention is something important. So I know that Obama here, here did something similar, telling people to learn to code. But here it was a recognition as part of the cultural heritage, not just a way of making business. Then we have gone around and discussed with other people. Of course, we have the Free Software Foundation, Open Source Initiative, also ACM, the Clips Foundation, some ministries in different communities, uh, and many others that you can find on the website that support what we are doing. This is putting words be behind their support. And then there are people who is putting money behind their words. So Microsoft, Intel, a big bank, so State General Google recently, Huawei, then you had Nokia, the last. You have universities, University of Bologna, University of Quebec. GitHub is a sponsor today also, but well, it has been acquired, but it's still a separate company. This is a national archive of science in, in the Netherlands and others coming, and of course, everybody is welcome to them here. Uh, the next step uh, is to set up the foundation. We already started doing it, creating a community. In fact, again, coming here is part of this, asking you to become part of this. Use it. It is not my project. It's not a project by INRIA. It is really open to everybody. It's an infrastructure we are building. Just take part of it. And then this is very important. So, you know, making sure we don't lose this stuff. You have basically two ways. One, say, one way is to say, I will hire the best engineers. I get a lot of money. I will do the best and then go away. Nothing to look at because we are the best and we do it in the best way possible. Well, being a computer scientist uh, with uh, some experience, I know that usually this doesn't work a lot. So it, it's much better to say, hey, we will make mistakes. It will fail in one place or the other. So let's design a system that can stand failure. I'm mean, talking to you. I mean, I think you know what I mean. And so I just took an advice from this person here that happens to be the fourth president of the United States. And this was written by the guy who created the network of public libraries. Okay. Uh, and he was answering to somebody who sent him some important document from the American Revolution that was saved from fire. And in this letter, he was answering this guy saying, well, what is lost is lost, but let us say what remains. And, and you see, I mean, I will, you, I just let you read it. It's beautiful, really beautifully written. And it, this is basically the reliable system 101. Okay, so make copies around. So we are creating a mirror network, and I'm finishing. So you can help. There are a lot of scientific technological challenges, the object storage, machine learning, classification, graph queries, etc. You, you, you can contribute to the source code. 
You can help us getting more full funding. You can donate ten dollars here. We, this is set up to, to the foundation. You can help become a sponsor of the project. You can use the archive and tell everybody to use this. So I finish here. And the we have one message, online question. You have the key. The key message is: come in. It's open. Yeah. Um. <laughs> The website, um, uh, softwareheritage.org slash archive, gives the doom3player.cpp the SHA1 hash as an example, but how does she actually see the content of the player.cpp? Let's see. It's, um, yeah, www.softwareheritage.org slash archive. Okay. She went there. Ah, no, no, okay. Yeah. It, you need to go to archive.softwareheritage.org. Ah, oh, okay. Archive.softwareheritage.org. Okay. Um, so I really like the fact that you're capturing all sorts of I like this project a lot. I'm thinking about all the discussions that happen around software that don't end up in source code. Sure. Like re reviews, comments. Are you thinking about preserving the, sort of the, the community activity around software? Is that that, that's a of modern software development. That, that's a very important. Thanks, Arthur. That's a very important question. So basically, if you really want to preserve all the knowledge around this kind of software, source code is a very important part of it. But you have a lot of extra information, which is typically the documentation, the discussion of the mailing list, the backtracking system, information on, on uh, stack overflow, uh, places like this one. So of course, in the general mission, we need to preserve all this. But in our point of view, it, it, I, I like a lot the Unix philosophy. You remember, Unix philosophy basically tells you, do one thing, do it well, and make sure you can interface with other tools. And that's the pipes in the, the, the Unix command line. So we have look at the round to see who is doing what. So for example, there is a project, I think you know it very well, which is GH Torrent, which is archiving the issues, for example, of Gitad and Georgios, who is a colleague in the Netherlands, he, he is actually making it more generic. He, he just got a grant from the European Union in the last, last few weeks for a new version of the project which expanded to cover other forges, not just Gitad, also GitLab and others. And we are working with him. We are actually using his event feed as one of the way of keeping track of other places. So you see, our point is not to do what others do, but make sure that we work together. Then you have information about software in Wikidata, for example. And so there is a discussion, which is very long, on how to use uh, software heritage identifiers in Wikidata. And then uh, there, are, there is a question of the, the mailing lists. And so there is Gmail project, which is more or less, but archives a lot of the groups and the mailing list around it. Um, Stack Overflow has a regular dump of the contents, which is a few gigabytes, so it is easy to preserve. So for now, we are trying to cover something that nobody does, which is source code. But of course, we are very, very conscious of the fact that there are many other things to do. And the point is to get in touch and create a community, which is not easy. It takes years, uh, as you know. I have a question. Since I have the mic, um, we've had a speaker come here and speak about our OpenSci project, which archives the science data as well as the tools. Now, they're, I believe, using GitHub. Does that mean that their code is also sure. being automatically indexed by it you is guys? Automatically indexed in our, uh, okay, in our good. base. The only point is we are lagging behind because I told you, I mean, this, there is doubling of uh, original content every 30 months and means, I mean, uh, goes up a lot. So we have a few months of lag. But to give another example of things that can happen working with the community, do you know this site, swmath.org? This is an, an incredible place where uh, uh, a, a, a bunch of, of uh, people in Germany actually went around and detected 
hundreds of thousands of scientific articles in mathematics and applied mathematics to identify a few tens of thousands of projects which are very important, sort of projects which are very important in mathematics. And then, for example, this one, SEMIPAR, which is a R package for semi-parametric regression, is uh, one of these scientific software in mathematics. And if you go down, you see they actually have the list of all the papers using or mentioning this software, and then the pointer to the standard article that describes this particular software. You have the keywords, you have the number of citations, etc., etc. And then, when we met them last year, they had this issue because, uh, yes, they had a pointer to the website of the project, but how do you archive it? So they went to the Internet Archive to archive the particular version of the website. But what about code? How can we archive the code? So we discuss it a bit, and the result is now, on all projects that have a code pointer there, you have this code link here, and guess where it goes when you click? It goes here. On one of the many views, you have the, this is the, the list of visits we did on, the, on this particular project. If you take the last one, you see that exact, exactly the thing pointed by the article. So, to go just a little bit on our construction, um, I'm curious if you thought too much about how to separate source code from other things that look like source code next to source code. You know, people don't file documentation, things that are not exactly source code, but are still probably things you'd want to save in GitHub repository all the time. Can you categorize them somehow or do you do something? A very good question. And actually, let me rephrase it in another way. The question you're asking is, how are we going to qualify the content of the archive? What kind of filtering do we do on the object we pull into our archive? You know, that, that's one of the reasons when, when we go and talk to people in huge libraries, and in the French National Library, Library of Congress, and see these kind of people here, when I tell them we do not filter anything, they very big eyes saying, you are crazy. How are you going to do this? And why are you taking everything around? But you need to think. People who are librarian, they are used to physical objects. So they have a certain number of, uh, I mean, meters or full feet available to store the books. And when that's up, uh, you need to throw out something. So you better filter what you put in. We do not need to do this kind of filtering technically. But you are right, even if technically we can store it, why, why not doing something? But then philosophically, we do not know, uh, do any filtering because when something goes into the archive, in particular today with open source development where you have the software that goes to GitHub or to uh, GitLab or whatever, when it has just a hundred lines of code, you never know whether this is just uh, some crazy stuff that will go away or if it is the original, very important thing. And I have an example. You know PHP? So in 1995, when Erasmus Lerdov actually published the first version of this stuff, PHP actually meant personal home page tools. And he wrote a mail in the Usenet saying, I mean, I have a simple hack uh, to, to, to generate automatically web pages. Please go out and use it. At that moment, it didn't at all cross the notability threshold to go into Wikipedia or anything else. But today, it is the most used technology for websites, which is not a good thing, by the way. Take my advice. But anyway, uh, so, so we need to keep this stuff. But the other thing that changed is that recently, you see machine learning technology have evolved a lot. So there are things which were unfeasible 10 years ago and start to become feasible today. So what we do is actually to count on the fact that they will be able to actually categorize all this mess and say, I mean, this is crap, don't look at it, and this is interesting, with automatic tools in the next years. And by the way, we have just signed an agreement with Amazon to make the full uh, software heritage data set available as a public data set in Amazon for providing researchers a playground where to go and play with machine learning technology and see what they can come up with. I don't have an idea what they will come up with. But I can imagine, you know, the crazy idea I had sometimes was to 
I mean, look at all the projects. The projects which are kind of reasonably written, they always have a readme file that tries to describe what the project does. So you could try to classify these readme files, not the full project, just readme files. And it gives a lot of information. But again, there are 14 million readme files in our archive, so it's not easy. You need a place where to go and play with, and, and we do not have the same resources as you. I mean, in you know, computer science, with respect to physics, we have a smaller budget. So my solution is going to Amazon and see if they can provide it. And so this takes some time. We need to transfer the 200 terabytes. But in the next, next month or two, you will be able to go and play with the, these contents and apply any, I know, unsupervised classification tool and see what comes out of that. I hope this provides a kind of an answer. As a project archive of ingesting untrusted user data, um, you need to be resilient to uh, malicious actors. So uh, with that being said, how do you uh, handle uh, SHA-1 collisions and uh, sure. files? Sure. Very good question, too. So SHA-1 collision where something uh, is something which is easy to create now. I mean, one SHA-1 collision is easy to create. You just replicate the one that Google published, and you create another PDF file with exactly the same structure, the same uh, actor vectors in there. So what we actually do when we ingest content, we do not compute just the SHA-1. For every content, we compute the SHA-1, the SHA-1 Git, the SHA-256, and Blake Tour. So the chances that you can, uh, um, I mean, convince us not to, 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 to lose a piece of data, because this kind of collision, what does it mean? I mean, when I get some data, new data, I compute the hash. If I have seen it already, I don't collect it. So the only attack you can have is that I, you prevent me from archiving something else. Or you archive first something, something to prevent something else. This will not work, because we have already a bunch of other hashes around. Uh, on the internal nodes, the kind of more complicated, but you know, the attack vectors we, we know of today, I mean, the one published by Google, 6,000 years of compute time to get that, uh, that attack vector, uh, do not fit with the structure of the internal order that we are building. So I don't believe it is feasible today. Tomorrow, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, that's, that's okay. <laughs> and so I, I will be around today in a full day. So if you want to know more, uh, make criticism, uh, ask questions, etc., don't hesitate. I'm a very, very easygoing guy, so you can you can come and talk. <laughs> yeah, my words will be in the rotunda. Um, <laughs>